Welcome to UA Plus. UA Plus is a program about and for the University of Arizona community. You may wonder what kind of discoveries a Research One institution like the University of Arizona can make. U of A researchers, faculty, and students take on challenges big and small in life sciences. And in this episode of UA Plus, we take a deeper look into how it could help you. Today we take you inside the world's largest enclosed ecosystem that has found a new scientific purpose for U of A students. Biosphere is definitely one of those places that when you say you've worked there, people go, oh my goodness. That's Kristen Pache. Pache has spent most of her summer working and doing research at the Biosphere 2 as part of the REU program supervised by Mitch Pavo Zuckerman, who is the assistant research professor at Biosphere 2. One of the programs we're running right now is a program called the REU program, which stands for Research Experiences for Undergraduates. And it's a National Science Foundation funded summer program, mostly for students from universities that are either liberal arts schools or don't have very large research experience programs. We bring in about 10 students every summer. They spend 10 weeks living at Biosphere, doing research in labs and getting training. Pache is one of the 10 students who was picked to participate in the REU program. Okay. Pache is joined by Jennifer Pressler. The REU program it brings different uh, undergraduate researchers from across the country. I'm the only one from U of A. All the research done at the Biosphere 2 relates to life sciences. Pressler explains her research. I'm working on a geobiology project and so I work with four different types of very finely ground rock and see how plants are able to grow in that very primitive ecosystem. And so we test how plants by themselves grow and then we also use bacteria and fungus to see how they aid the growth. My project is actually behind me here working in the desert and we're just kind of getting everything set up. Uh, we're helping get like the soil into the sealed apparatuses so that it can be very sterile and then we're going to start growing the plants and inoculating the fungus and bacteria. The REU program pushes students out of their comfort zone to learn a new side of research. I was thrown into something completely different than what I've worked with at all. I was thrown into chemistry, organic chemistry to be specific. So. I've learned a little bit more about that considering I've not taken any organic chemistry classes yet, so it was a bit hard at first, but once I kind of got the hang of it, it was, it was pretty interesting. Pache explains her research project. I'm doing a comparative study between two plant species that we believe to be related and within the willow family, the seep willow and the coyote willow. And mostly what we're looking at is what kind of compounds they release the REU student program at Biosphere 2 creates well-rounded scientists and has great opportunities for students to get a feel for how the research life can be. Biosphere has a lot of opportunities for undergraduates and because it's allowing us to do research in the public face, it sort of gives us the opportunity to train students in a way that they're not normally trained at universities. So generally you spend your time locked in a lab or in the field and you never really engage the public at all. At Biosphere you're actually doing research while the tours are coming through so as an undergraduate you are exposed to the, the techniques of communicating with non-scientists which we think makes for more well-rounded and fully developed scientists. The students come out of the program with a lot of confidence in how to do research, so they've really taken a project from its inception. The REU students gain confidence, opportunities, and learn what the life of a field researcher consists of. But there is always more to learn and more to be done in a life of a scientist. Research has never finished. It's kind of cliche, but when you answer one question, more and more questions come up. It's like the scientist's life right there. Whether students are doing research in the field or in a lab, they find they are making a difference. Melanie Hunker meets students who are discovering what you have genetically in common with a fruit fly and how it may help cure one of the fastest growing diseases in the United States. UA student Mike Kushner is preparing fruit flies. It's part of a first of its kind experiment led by UA professor Dr. Linda Restifo. Fruit flies are the most complicated, simple animal that you can study if you want to understand the biology of the brain. Fruit fly genes are similar to those in humans. That knowledge led Dr. Restifo to her research on developmental disabilities. I realized that there was this gap 
in the knowledge about brain development and the ability to use that knowledge for therapeutics. So I started asking myself, why have doctors and scientists and the general public assumed that developmental brain disorders wouldn't be treatable? Now, Dr. Estifo and her team are reassessing that assumption. They test fruit flies to find a drug that will treat autism and developmental disorders. Autism is the fastest growing developmental disability in the United States. Doctors diagnose autism based on three criteria. Problems in social interaction, that's sort of considered to be the core feature of autism. And they have problems with uh, communication. Um, and then they have problems in repetitive behaviors or restricted interests. So those are the three core features for autism. Dr. Restifo recruited Dr. Guman to examine flies. She identified flies showing similar behaviors to her autistic patients, notably repetitive behaviors. The mutant flies, they would really get stuck. They would just groom and groom and groom the same part over and over and over. The team of students examines the differences in normal flies to mutant flies. They aren't nearly as exploratory as wild type flies and for the most part their interest is in grooming themselves. The second part of the research is examining mutant fly brain cells. In this lab we do apply different compounds uh, to the, the culture media, so uh, that, that can include drugs, toxins. The team looks at individual branches of brain cells under a microscope. They found that mutant flies exhibit curly stems on their cells. Curly stems result from a lack of protein essential to brain development. We can ask, well, can we find a drug that will make those cells look normal again? And that then becomes the starting point for looking for, for chemical compounds that could become safe and effective drugs. The team has already tested 1,040 drugs on these curly neurons. Their goal is to repurpose drugs already used to treat other disorders. Currently, doctors treat autistic patients by identifying a problematic behavior and treating with medication. With this research, the hope is that it's going beyond just the behavioral uh, symptomatic treatment, but actually looking at uh, what is actually wrong in the brain and maybe it can change those processes in the brain. They plan to target the core symptoms of autism. Dr. Estifo hopes the team can move to test mutant mice and eventually humans. We're, we're on the edge of, of the current state of human knowledge and we're trying to push that into the therapeutic domain. So how to translate this into safe and effective treatments for children. Sometimes it's the little things that have a big impact in medicine. Something as insignificant as a fruit fly can change the future of a disease and something as little as an ant bite can change the way you feel about pain. Producer Heather Woodridge introduces us to entomologist Justin Schmidt. I'm Justin Schmidt. I'm a research uh, adjunct at University of Arizona in Department of Entomology, and I study bugs. We're about four miles west of campus in my, my laboratory here. We have tarantula hawks, we have uh, velvet ants, and these are both fierce stinging creatures. Schmidt has made a career of studying bees, wasps, and ants. He is well known for creating the Schmidt Sting Pain Index for insect bites and stings. I've been working for over 20 years on tarantula hawks. It's the most painful stinging of, of all the insects in, in the U.S. And the sting is, is very ephemeral. It lasts two to three minutes and it's gone. And so then the question is, what chemically, biochemically, is in the venom that makes it work so that it hurts but goes away quickly. He has been working with chemists to analyze the venom to help solve problems in chronic pain management. Since the 1980s, he has been a member of the U of A Center for Insect Science, which focuses on collaborative research in biomedicine and biotechnology. He says an understanding of chemistry is central to understanding insect biology. Their antennae are quite amazing how they're so flexible. When I got my bachelor's in chemistry, my master's in chemistry at British Columbia, and, and then I said, well, it's time now to bring this back to my, my real love, which is the natural world. 
After getting his Ph.D. in entomology, he knew where he wanted to live and work. I dreamed of uh, coming to Tucson because it's, it's kind of the epicenter of stinging insects and, and it's just a, a wonderful place. We, we have more stinging insects, we have more species of almost any kind of life form right here in the Sonoran Desert than you'll find anywhere else in, in the U.S. Schmidt teaches a medical entomology class as well as a more general natural history class for non-majors where his knowledge and passion inspires students. Enthusiasm is contagious and you know if you're really excited and, and you have beautiful things and you show them and you tell them stories, most people I, I think will kind of get carried along with it. And you show them a, a beautiful tarantula or you show them a centipede or you, you show them a, a velvet ant that's gorgeous. You know. In education you, you have to do whatever you know, works. The idea is to get across concepts and make it fun. Insects have captured Schmidt's attention since he was first bitten while sitting on an anthill as a child. He says his passion for entomology is easy for his students to relate to because they share an inherent love of nature. And we're all set. Joining me now is producer Heather Woodrich. Welcome. Thank you, Alexandra. UA Plus has provided us with two different stories on insects, one being the fruit fly research and the other was on entomologist Justin Schmidt. Why do you think bug research is so popular in Arizona? Well, I learned from Dr. Schmidt that we have the greatest diversity of insects here in Arizona, and that includes biting and stinging insects. Did you find anything else surprising while you were visiting in Dr. Schmidt's lab? Yes, when we arrived there, I didn't know that there were going to be any living things, and so it turns out that he regularly still goes out into the field to collect specimens for his research. Weren't you scared something was going to pop out and maybe bite you? No, he makes a point of educating people all the time that most insects can't do you any harm at all. So when we saw the vinegaroon, which looked really terrifying, crawling across his hand, it actually can't harm you. Speaking about harmless insects, Dr. Schmidt came up with a pain index. Can you tell me about that? Yes, the pain index is a scale from one to four, one being the least painful bite or sting and four being the most painful. He also has these really charismatic descriptions for the sensation of each type of pain. So for example, the sweat bee is a one on the index, uh, and he describes it as light, ephemeral, and almost fruity. The tarantula hawk is a four on the pain index, and he describes that type of pain as blinding, fierce, shockingly electric, and almost feeling like if you dropped a hair dryer into your bubble bath. I thought it was really interesting that Dr. Schmidt knows so much about pain. He's learned a lot on his own over the years and also by collaborating with other researchers. Let's take a look at an institution that's founded on collaboration between students, engineers, and researchers from different fields to solve life sciences problems. At the University of Arizona, located in the Keening Building, Dr. Fernando Martinez and his colleagues, Dr. Carol Barnes and Dr. Jennifer Barton, overlook an institution that fosters creativity and facilitates collaboration between scientists, engineers, doctors, and students. Special light source comes down. Our basic objective is collaboration. The history of, of the Bio5 Institute is a very interesting one and almost uh, represents the way in which, in general, uh, science works. It all starts with new ideas, a new way of doing life sciences. The faculty who are drawn to Bio5 are naturally collaborative. That's, that's the real magic of Bio5. Bio5 collaborates with basic science, agriculture, medicine, pharmacy, and engineering, but the most important collaborative aspects are the students. Having students involved is so important that we have built the pipeline of future scientists here in the state of Arizona. And they take on a real research project. These students make a real contribution to the labs that they're in. Bio5 Institute does a lot of different types of outreach, education, and training. So one of our flagship programs that we do in concert with the College of Pharmacy is the KEYS program, or Keep Engaging Youth in Science. You can also research and see how drugs are working. One of the high school students who is part of the KEYS program is Caitlin Meerdahl. The KEYS program is a program that allows high school students to participate in research hands-on at the university. Researchers allowed us to work in their lab and it's a great experience. 
So in my lab, most of the work is done by students. Those students are the ones who come in here every day and they do the experiments and they do the hard work to make these things happen. And um, when we do the clinical trials, they help go over there and they get suited up and they go into the operating room and help with that too. Bio5 taught me a lot of hands-on uh, experience, um, a lot of hands-on sort of lessons that I couldn't have learned in class. So that's been really fun. And then also just another aspect of engineering that I didn't really think about. You cannot teach how research is done in a, in a formal classroom uh, very effectively. You really have to get into the lab and um, do it, and it's really an apprenticeship. Bio5 has created new ideas and new solutions to many life sciences problems, like creating a chemo-preventative drug and creating the first malaria-free mosquito. At Bio5, collaboration and thinking out of the box create solutions to help people. We're kind of in the world of the unknown. We don't know what's going to happen. And even evaluating this data, it's like, you know, you could really help people by doing the work that you do. Through collaboration and partnerships, UA Life Sciences is educating students and the community. To find additional stories and information on these topics and more, follow, like, and watch UA Plus.